Before I begin this episode, I felt the need to talk to you guys as myself. This episode is covering a highly controversial work, and I have little doubt that there will be lots of arguments and discussions aplenty in the comments section. And while I'm always worried about that, I know in my heart it's nothing to really be concerned about. If I've learned anything after five plus years and 300 episodes of this, it's that my fans and viewers are some of the smartest, kindest, and most civil people out there. With all that out of the way, welcome to a top of the fourth wall where bad comics burn. Hmm. It's Miller time. Let's dig into Frank Miller's Holy Terror. You know, in 300 episodes, you may have picked up that I'm not particularly fond of Frank Miller. The ever-growing insanity of comic book writer Frank Miller. Miller before he went nuts, mad writings of comic book writer and artist Frank Miller. The ever-growing insanity of comic book writer and artist Frank Miller. The growing insanity and awful works of comic book writer Frank Miller. And let's not forget how he whizzed on Will Eisner's grave. No, no, I have nothing nice to say about Frank Miller these days. He's pretty loathsome. Frank Miller can't write women unless they're in some way sexualized. Frank, I can't direct a movie to save my life, Miller. Why, I hate this racist, misogynistic sack of crap to begin with. What are you trying to say, Frank? What is the point of this miniseries? Notice also Miller sexualizing a friggin' city. The segment where Frank Miller is king, as well as the jester. You'd think that this was just standard Miller idiocy at play to draw women with questionable anatomy. The story of one man's quest to ruin his own reputation as a great writer. Knowing Frank, he'd probably put instructions in the script telling the artist to make sure that we focused on her ass shaking from side to side as she ran. Frank would have probably screwed that up too. He passed creepy a long time ago. I know, I've been very subtle about it, but it's there. Today we're covering a book called Holy Terror, quite possibly the worst Frank Miller comic ever published. The only way he could make a worse book is if it was literally nothing but drawings of people defecating for a hundred pages. Well, I take that back. One could probably find some kind of bizarre artistic merit from that and it would be considered less racist. Well, unless all the people defecating were Arabs. I'm just giving Frank ideas at this point, aren't I? 
Holy Terror was originally going to be a Batman book, called, of course, Holy Terror Batman, to echo the catchphrase of Burt Ward from the 60s Batman series. We'll forgive for the moment that there is already an Elseworlds story from DC called Batman Holy Terror, which of course wouldn't cause confusion at all. The idea behind the book was to take the silliness of propaganda comics of the 1940s, where Captain America or Daredevil punched Hitler and transplanted into the modern day with Al-Qaeda. To a degree, I understood and actually kind of enjoyed that kind of thing. Because when someone is an unrepentant mass murderer, someone who is truly evil and doesn't believe themselves to be the case, there is nothing more cathartic than seeing them get some kind of comeuppance. And to be perfectly honest, when they first announced the project... I was actually kind of into it! A silly little send-up of those old propaganda comics transplanted into modern times, just with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda instead of Nazis or the like. But then me and everybody else kind of took a step back and rethought that a bit. See, that kind of propaganda in those comics varied. Yes, there was racism, there's no denying the depictions of Japanese individuals, but even those comics offered depictions of people who were not evil, but just as much victims of hostile governments. Hell, in Daredevil Battles Hitler, the end of the first story shows a German factory worker cursing that his people don't seem brave enough to oppose the Nazis. Implying that they're cowards? Yes, but at the same time, it's shown as being out of fear of reprisal, not because they're evil. Hell, that same comic book features the racist caricature The Claw decimating a village of innocents in an Asian country just to prove his own points and show what a villain he was. Was it racist? Yes, but it still showed that there were innocents in all of this. In Holy Terror, if you're a Muslim or Arabic, you are a terrorist. And I'm not asking for a positive depiction of Muslims in the story as a counterbalance, as if this was an after-school special. I'm saying that if this was supposed to be an old-school propaganda comic, it should have been a lot sillier than this. See, you've got a writer like uh, Grant Morrison, who is obsessed with gold and silver age minutia in comics, and treats everything in superhero comic history as if it's canon, no matter how much it contradicts itself or doesn't make sense with modern depictions, and it's very similar to how Frank Miller should be writing this book, trying to create an insane parody of propaganda. And yet, ironically, even Grant Morrison was criticizing this idea, calling it decadent indulgence when real terrorists are killing real people in the real world. Then again, he also challenged the then 49-year-old Frank Miller to join the army if he cared that much about it, so what you gonna do? But anyway, yeah, this should be a silly propaganda comic that's just as ridiculous as the ones from 1941. But Frank, here's the thing that you're struggling with, and I know it's a difficult concept to wrap your brain around, so try to bear with me here. It's not 1941 anymore. In 1941, it was okay to have phrases like slap a jap. In 1941, black people weren't allowed to go to school with white people. In 1941, straight up propaganda against the enemy was seen as okay, no matter the negative consequences. Manzanar, anyone? My point is that things that were okay to do in 1941 are not okay to do now because we realized that those things were really not good things. The reason we like ridiculous racist propaganda comics these days is because we like them ironically. You can't play it straight like you do in this. This book takes itself completely and utterly seriously without a hint of irony. We should have Al-Qaeda rampaging through America in giant robots. We should have the head of Osama bin Laden in a jar using psychic mind powers against the American military. We should have all the terrorists be defeated by offering them hostess fruit pies. But then again, we really shouldn't have been surprised that it ended up like it did. Frank Miller was not the person you want to have working on a comic like this. He lived in New York when 9-11 happened, and in in the wake of it... Well, here are some choice quotes from Frank Miller. I can tell you squat about Islamism, but I know a lot about Al-Qaeda, and they need to burn in hell. Propaganda has, over time, become a pejorative term. 
News objectivity is a 20th century myth. We only complain about propaganda when we don't agree with it. For some reason, nobody seems to be talking about who we're up against and the 6th century barbarism that they actually represent. I'm speaking into a microphone that never could have been a product of their culture. Some will say that last quote is referring to terrorists and not Arab civilizations, but terrorists are not civilizations. Terrorists are not a culture, and as this comic will show, Frank Miller does not make a distinction between the two. Frank Miller is racist. There is no way of dancing around it. But hey, so were lots of other famous writers in history, and some of them are still heralded in classrooms for their skills. A pity then that Frank Miller has become such a bad writer. As I said, this was supposed to be a Batman comic. Frank has said that about halfway through writing it, he realized that it was not a Batman story, and that the hero is much closer to Dirty Harry than Batman. And yet that didn't stop you from writing Crazy Steve over an ass bar, did it, Frankie? While he says that, I have a different theory about it. What changed was that DC editor Bob Shrek was laid off from DC and became the editor-in-chief of Legendary Comics. Now, Shrek was apparently the one championing the book, and when he was gone from DC, Frank took Holy Terror with him to work for Legendary. Admittedly, it's possible that it was just in combination with the aforementioned quote about it not being a Batman story. Personally, I feel it more likely that DC told him that they weren't going to print it after Shrek left since it was garbage that portrayed their biggest cash cow as a racist lunatic. And despite Frank's protestations about it not being a Batman story, all the superficial elements of Batman exist in this comic, just without the meat, bones, and names. In fact, you can actually think of this as just another issue of Ass Bar. This is clearly meant to be Batman. Well, Frank's version of Batman anyway. And I don't mean the Batman who he once said is as good and pure a superhero as you can find. No, no, no. This is the Batman who calls 12-year-olds retarded because they don't like the name Batmobile. The Batman who makes that same 12-year-old eat rats after his parents were murdered before his eyes. The Batman who loves violence and inflicting pain more than he does actually fighting crime. And with all of that out of the way, let's finally talk about the book itself. For starters, what the hell is up with the idiotically bizarre dimensions of this comic? Look at this thing! Who prints comic books like this? And yeah, I've seen comics that are not the standard sizing, but those ones are still comparable to normal and have a good reason for their proportions. Web comics in particular tend to print books with different dimensions, but that's because they're originally made for a web page. This book was straight to comic book shops in its current form. It was designed to be like this. I can't even fit this oversized piece of crap on my regular bookshelves without it sticking out over the edge. It only fits back there, alongside other garbage I reviewed, because these shelves aren't really bookshelves, just deeper shelves in general. Maybe the idea is that I'm supposed to turn it vertically so that no one can see I own a copy. Oh wait, it doesn't fit that way either! Yeah, we haven't even analyzed the cover yet, and already I'm yelling. That is how bad this thing is. Oh yeah, the cover sucks too. It features our main character, not Batman. Oh, I'm sorry. His name is The Fixer. Who the hell names himself The Fixer? That's not a superhero. That's someone who spays and neuters cats. So anyway, The Fixer is punching a mummy or something. Oh, my apologies. That's supposed to be a terrorist. I got confused because I have no idea what the hell that headscarf is supposed to be. I did try to look up the terms of various garments worn by Muslims, and this thing doesn't look like any of them. You know how in the past I've been annoyed because people will point out a mistake I made in the comments over and over? Well, guess what, guys? I am begging you to tell me what the hell this thing is, if it even is anything. Maybe it is a mummy. Oh, actually, I know exactly what it is. Poorly drawn, just like the rest of the cover. 
The fixer is punching this guy, and apparently he's doing it so hard that a stream of teeth are defying gravity and flying out of his mouth in a straight horizontal line. Help, I'm falling at a 60 degree angle, breaking all the laws of physics. And while we're on the subject of the teeth, look how bloody those things are. Did this guy take a bite out of raw meat before he got into a fight with the fixer? Oh, but we can't forget about the fixer himself and his brilliant superhero costume. Look, I know he was supposed to be Batman, but he could have tried something to give him a more original look. His outfit is just brown. It's a brown face mask and a brown shirt and brown gloves. Well, I say this is a costume. Frankly, with how many lines it has and how tattered and ripped apart it is, it looks like the guy just threw on a bunch of stained rags he found in his basement. And there's another thing that his fixer name apparently doesn't apply to. Sewing! Dear Lord, we're still talking about this cover. I'm devoting a full page of this review to it. That's how awful it is. What else is there to talk about? Oh, how about the wheat strands attached to the terrorist's clothes? Or is that straw? Or the ends of a scarf? Or are they supposed to be action lines or something from the punch? What the hell are these tassels? Did this guy make his outfit out of curtains? Oh, but let's forget about those and talk about this knife. Crocodile Dundee is looking at that knife and putting away his own in shame. It's as big as the fixer's head with two different serrated edges on the back and two spikes on the hilt. Who makes a knife like that except a 10 year old who doesn't know any better? Dude, that knife is awesome! It's the kind of knife that shows that no matter how you stab the villain, they're always gonna end up with an awesome scar! Oh, but let's not forget about the perspective. Mummy Muslim has wrapped his ginormous hand and arm around the fixer to a degree that the knife is in front of his head, despite the arm being behind his shoulder. We have not even begun this comic yet, people. I implore you, pray for me. We open with a two-page spread of a quote. If you meet the infidel, Kill the infidel. This is sourced as Mohammed. Yeah, funny thing about this quote. <laughs> it's entirely made up. Now, there are bits in the Quran referring to Muslims killing non-Muslims, but quotes are a funny thing. You take anything out of the context of what was written around it, and suddenly it means something entirely different. The Quran refers to Muslims killing non-Muslims, in self-defense. In fact, it specifically states to never start a fight because Allah does not like aggressors. There are also bits about making peace with non-Muslims, sheltering them if they're in need, and then conveying them to safety. Funny how easy it is to do a fact check with a simple Google search, but hey, we can't expect Frank Miller to do that kind of intense research. I mean, this was published such a long time ago, all the way back in 2011. And by the way, if this is about terrorists and not Muslims at large, why are we opening with a supposed quote from Muhammad? Wouldn't it be more accurate and effective to quote Osama bin Laden or something? It's not like we're wanting for quotes from terrorists about wanting to kill the infidel. But if we're playing the take religious quotes out of context game, Frankie, I can play too. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. The entire assembly must stone him. Whether an alien or native born, when he blasphemes the name, he must be put to death. Leviticus 2416, New International Version. Actually, that was very wrong of me. If we're playing by Frank Miller's rules, we should be totally making up the quote and then not sourcing it properly. Let's try this again. Adam, either you put on some damn pants or this relationship is over. Eve, we truly open with... Lots and lots of whiteout spilled onto the page. Oh, I'm sorry. Checking the next page, we see that this is clearly supposed to be rain. Or possibly snow. 
To be fair, when it comes to Frank Miller's art, his greatest strength has always been his use of negative space, contrasting black and white colors to create images. Unfortunately, it's the weather effects that are really suffering here and making it look like he accidentally had a seizure while drawing the rain. This is Empire City, obviously the stand-in for Gotham, even down to the Statue of Liberty-esque statue that Gotham is sometimes depicted as having. But hey, while we're on the subject of Gotham City, it's time to meet Not Batman and Not Catwoman. The two are running around on a rooftop with Not Catwoman naturally wearing a thong, a shoulderless top, and fishnet stockings. I would remind you that Frank Miller is the guy who reimagined Catwoman in Batman Year One as a prostitute in similar garb. Frank Miller, if she ain't a prostitute yet, just give me a few pages. I find myself utterly confused by not Catwoman's footwear. Are they supposed to be roller skates? That wouldn't make any sense for the rooftop parkour she's doing. Why are they the only things colored red on these pages? You would color them red like that to draw specific attention to them, except the more I look at them, the more baffled I get. Again, are they roller skates? Some kind of fancy shoe bottoms? Why are the shoe bottoms getting the red color? How can they even be the bottoms of the shoes? We see in several shots that she'd have to have her legs extended out in a way that makes no sense. But if they're not the shoe bottoms, why then do her feet come to little stumps? But whatever. Eight pages in, not counting the quote, we finally get some real dialogue that's not grunting. Natalie Stack, cat burglar, on the run. He's right on my ass. Right on my ass. What is his goddamn problem? All I did was steal a lousy diamond bracelet, and now he's right on my ass. Just in case you were wondering if the writing is less repetitive from Frankie in recent years, there's your answer. Oh, and nice use of the black and white narration captions. At first, I thought it was a narrator or the fixer talking about Natalie Stack, but apparently she was talking about herself. What? The captions aren't different in any other way, so they must be coming from the same damn person. So glad that the only color on the page was given to her shoes. After some more evasion on random rooftops, which looks as if Frank decided to use finger painting on the edges of the page to smudge everything, Miss Stack scratches her not cat nails down the side of a building in a totally not Catwoman fashion, and I begin to question the formatting of the book again. I'm showing you the full page so you can get a whole glimpse of this. Notice something about the two sets of panels? Comic books, manga notwithstanding, traditionally follow a read left to right format, just like regular books. Sure, there's variation, like with the left side here with three panels stacked on top of each other, and then the big panel next to them, but it's how it usually goes. Except here, we've got two entire sets of panels that are unconnected. With how they're sized, frankly, it looks like he started drawing the comic in standard format, but then changed in the middle of working on the thing so that it was this oversized crap. To be honest, it makes me feel like the comic is twice as long as it is, and it's already 120 pages! Ugh. Anyway, she scratches the walls and hangs on for dear life. Lucky girl. Lucky. Nine lives and all that. If she's not called Catwoman, why does she talk about nine lives? Did they just forget to edit this? Anyway, thanks to some random white scratches on the page, she falls off the side of the building. Oh, and we do have some more color that I just noticed. Dark green eyes. This comic feels like a half-completed paint-by-numbers book. Fortunately for her, the fixer swings over and catches her while she does the subway sandwich thighs thing in the air. Because when you're falling to your death, you want to make it look like you're kneeling. And check out the fixer's bullet belt and gun in a holster. I am rather curious if that was part of the plan for the original Batman stuff. I think that might have made the folks at DC tilt their heads a little. And geez, just look at this pose on Natalie Stack. What the hell is this expression and pose? E oh, and the fixer's brilliant plan to save them both is to swing back towards the rooftop, let go of the line, and have the two crash into the roof while clinging to each other. And then he handcuffs her. Naturally, Miss Stack does not take kindly to this and kicks the fixer right in the balls. Knowing what's going to come later on in this comic, this image of the fixer getting his crotch kicked is gonna be my happy place from here on out. 
The two promptly kick the crap out of each other, and naturally, with this basically being a Sin City comic with Batman, it quickly turns into awkward sexual violence when the two begin making out with each other. They kiss, fall off the rooftop onto another rooftop, while the moon hangs behind them, friggin' huge and imposing, making me hope that this comic will end with the moon colliding with the planet and killing everyone. And we even get to see that a sound effect of them falling is... Crunk. That was crunk. So after some more of them hitting each other and making out, sexy, sexy violence, sexy, sexy violence, it's time for another classic Miller trademark to make its appearance. I hate your guts. Sure you do. I hate your guts. You make me sick. Sure I do. You ever had a deja vu, Joel? Make me sick. Now. Sure I will. And they proceed to vomit all over each other. Or the sun explodes, given this page. Just a slow night. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. Ah, great. Frank's record is skipping. Someone hit the jukebox! I'm not too far off with the sun exploding comment. It turns out that there is an explosion. A nail bomb has been detonated, sending dozens, no, hundreds of nails out into the air. And already it is ridiculous because the explosion is so bright and powerful and there are so many nails and they're being flung up so high that they're reaching rooftops that it just seems pointless. If the explosion is that big and powerful, they'd be dead from the explosion already. But yeah, they shoot out everywhere and hit Miss Stack right in the leg, who begins yelling Jesus' name over and over again because I imagine that really friggin' hurts. Oh, and the fixer is completely unaffected, just kinda rolls away without any damage. I think, anyway, since he's so bloody and bruised from the earlier sex combat that I can't tell. And of course, because Miss Stack is SMRT, she pulls the nail out of her leg, and for some reason there isn't any blood on it. Are her legs not real? But then why would she be in pain from the nail? Oh, screw it. A nail. A goddamn nail. What the hell's a goddamn nail doing stuck in my goddamn leg? The goddamn thing? He's still doing the whole goddamn Batman thing, even though it's not supposed to be a Batman comic! Frank, do you hate the meme? Is that why you keep injecting it in long past the point where anybody cared about it? Are you trying to make us sick of it? Are you just ashamed that the work you did for All-Star Batman and Robin got reduced to an internet joke? If that's the case, may I offer some advice? Don't write such blatantly idiotic things and we won't make fun of you for it! What the hell is going on? It's war, darling. It's war. Huh! Good God, y'all! What is it good for? It really hurts. I know it, baby. I know it hurts. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. We cut to 10 minutes ago. Oh god, is this gonna be like Aspar's confused time scale? I can't go back, bro! Fortunately not. Instead, let's meet Amina, a foreign exchange student and humanities major. And also, since she's a woman in a Frank Miller comic, she has extremely puffy lips. Empire City, USA. This city is... a uh, comma splice there, Frank. Because poor literacy is expected from uneducated, bigoted morons. Cold and wet and noisy, and so very proud of itself. It also had this problem of giant gargoyle statues that anybody can just walk onto, apparently. Mind you, I'm assuming the pink shape there is Amina, but then what the hell is she sitting on? The two hell dogs from Ghostbusters? Empire City. Cold. Wet. Noisy. Repetitive. Haughty. Arrogant. Always building itself up bigger. Taller, like some mad gaggle of robots, always climbing. How dare we take advantage of vertical space? Wayside school is the devil! Its towers stab into the sky like sharpened sticks aimed at the eyes of God. Is Frank Miller under the impression that skyscrapers don't exist in Muslim countries? Oh, silly question. I forgot. He's the guy who thinks they couldn't have figured out microphones. He must think that people in the United Arab Emirates live in ramshackle huts and mud igloos. 
Just for the sake of accuracy, this image right here, it's the Burj Khalifa, or the Khalifa Tower. It's the tallest building in the world, and currently resides in Dubai. A tower or two previously, the record was held by the Patronus Towers in Malaysia. I'm curious, how comfortable is your head, Frank, when it's shoved so far up your own ass? Empire City. Proud. Arrogant. Haughty. Wet. Cold. Okay, Frank, we get it! You don't own a thesaurus! Move on! I don't even know what we're looking at anymore. Some giant pink monster with a xenomorph head looking at a construction site? What the hell is this? Apparently there was an explosion in the distance, and Amina is met by some girl whose face is constantly hidden in shadow. It's a bizarre artistic choice to make. As we're about to learn, Amina is a terrorist herself. But she's completely visible. The innocent girl she's talking to is the one almost always hidden in shadow and obscured. Amina looks like the friggin' main character herself. Big innocent eyes, we see her clearly. What the hell? Anyway, yeah, the girl, named Jay, asks Amina if she wants to be standing there, whatever there is, because the rain is making things slippery. You worry for me, a stranger. Is this one of your human emotions? Jay says she spotted her walking out and figured she came out to smoke and decided to do the same. I don't smoke, Jay, but I'll take a swig of that beer. And indeed, Jay hands her the beer and she takes a sip of it. My first alcohol, ever. Religious reasons or not, if you realized what comic you were in, you would be chugging that bottle. 